Hi everyone and welcome to <clears throat> the presentation on Parallel File I.O. Profiling using Darshan. This is a series of webinars <clears throat> organized by the Performance Optimization and Productivity Project, which is a European Commission funded project. <clears throat> the format of this webinar will be uh, 30 minutes of presentation and followed by 10 minutes of questions and answers. I'll encourage people to <clears throat> ask questions during the webinar and I'll hopefully uh, try and aim to answer those questions at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> and the slides and the recording will be made available to everyone who's registered. <clears throat> so today's agenda is um, shown here, introduction to parallel storage and file systems, parallel IO models available for MPI codes, and I'll talk about the, of course, the Darshan profiling tool, and that will include a live demo. And I'll also present some Darshan case studies <clears throat> and how the tool has been used to optimize the I.O. of real applications and some programming hints and tips on how to write efficient I.O. for MPI codes and questions and answers. <clears throat> So the <clears throat> stack on the left shows the entire parallel I.O. stack. At the very top, you have your application, which does the uh, computation <clears throat> as well as the communication between the MPI processes. And underneath your application, you have your high-level I.O. libraries, such as ParallelNet CDF or Parallel HDF5. <clears throat> and underneath that <clears throat> is MPI I.O. So ParallelNet CDF and HDF5, <clears throat> they use MPIO to do the I.O. And <clears throat> MPIO is part of the 2.0 standard, which has been around for some time. Underneath the I.O. middleware, you have I.O. forwarding, <clears throat> and these exist as daemons on the compute nodes, and they aggregate I.O. Underneath the I.O. forwarding system, you have your actual parallel file systems, such as GPFS, <clears throat> Lustre, Panassas, and underneath your parallel file system, at the very bottom, you have your, uh, your hard drives, RAID devices, and this could include SSDs and VRAM and traditional spinning disks. <clears throat> uh, science uh, has become quite data intensive, and that's one of the reasons why I'm covering um, high performance I.O. in this webinar. Um, file I.O. is required for writing simulation data. <clears throat> of course, your code does something, it calculates something, and you want to be able to store that and save that. And it's also used for checkpointing in case <clears throat> uh, hard nodes fail or reading data for model validation. And examples of data intensive science projects are square kilometer array, particle physics at CERN, <clears throat> environmental sciencing, and genomic sequencing. File I.O. in computational science tends to be write once <clears throat> and read many. And with this, you can uh, exploit that characteristic. <clears throat> this is a very simple schematic diagram of a parallel storage architecture. At the very top, you have your compute nodes. <clears throat> and you, normally, there's hundreds or thousands of these compute nodes. And they connect to usually a storage network. And this is a dedicated storage network, which doesn't do deal with the inter-process communication. And that's connected to a switch. And on that network, the storage nodes are connected to there. And the storage nodes are connected directly to the storage devices. So they could be direct attached storages, or they could <clears throat> be SAN systems, or they could be RAID systems. <clears throat> and the way <clears throat> you achieve parallel I.O. <clears throat> is that you try and use a number of storage nodes to do the I.O. for you. <clears throat> Here we have three, <clears throat> so you can potentially have three storage nodes doing your I.O. So the compute node sends the I.O. request to the storage nodes, and the storage nodes do the I.O. for you. And in between your compute nodes <clears throat> and storage nodes, you can have something known as burst buffers. And they store very large bandwidth data, which the network can't, the storage nodes cannot handle. <clears throat> and uh, the data gets stored on the burst buffers, and then they are drained onto the storage nodes. So the two types of storage nodes, <clears throat> one is a metadata node, <clears throat> and one is a data node. 
metadata nodes <clears throat> store things such as file owner, <clears throat> access time, and Linux inode data. <clears throat> so that can also include which storage nodes have bits of the file. And data nodes <clears throat> store the actual file data. And <clears throat> usually there are much, uh, many more data nodes than metadata nodes. Luster and Panassis have dedicated uh, metadata nodes, whereas GPFS <clears throat> strides the metadata across the storage nodes. And one thing to note is that parallel file systems are bandwidth bound, <clears throat> meaning that you should try and write as much data as possible in fewer requests. And I'll talk more about that in the presentation. <clears throat> so what are the factors to <clears throat> consider when doing parallel I.O.? The first is the number of MPI processes that you have, <clears throat> which is N, and the total amount of data to read and write. And then you have the size of the files involved. So when you're doing your parallel decomposition, the file size divided by N should be sufficiently large. <clears throat> so if you have a very small file, for example, a 100 megabyte <clears throat> uh, file, and you're reading it across 100 <clears throat> uh, or, or a thousand or a million MPR ranks, each chunk would be quite small, so that might not be uh, sufficiently large. Then you have number of files involved, <clears throat> and the stripe count, which is the number of storage nodes available, and the stripe size of the parallel file system. And that is the block of data that is written to a storage node. So I'll now talk about parallel I.O. models available for MPI codes. Um, so the very first is one file per MPI process. So <clears throat> the circles represent the MPI process <clears throat> and the bit at the bottom is a file. So in this model, each process writes to its own file. Then you have the single file model, <clears throat> which is where one MPI process is involved in doing I.O. So that one more MPI process can do the writing or the reading. So it gathers all the data from all the other MPI ranks using MPI gather, and it distributes it using MPI scatter. Then you have the shared file model. <clears throat> this is where all your MPI processes write to a <clears throat> unique file, and they write to a unique portion of their file. And it's very important that they write to a unique portion of their file because if not, that could create race conditions. Then there's the alternative shared file model, <clears throat> which is denoted by M colon one, where M is less than N, and N is the total number of MPI processes. <clears throat> and M MPI processes are responsible for the IO, and they again write to a single shared file, and they write to a unique portion of the file. Then there's the hybrid model, <clears throat> where the MPI processes are grouped into M, <clears throat> Uh, groups, and they each group writes to its own unique file. <clears throat> I'll now talk about the Darshan profiling tool. Darshan is open source and can download can be downloaded from uh, reference one, which is at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> the tool must be built with the same MPI distribution as your application. However, you can use the GNU compilers for building. It doesn't have to be the same compiler that you use to build your application. And it is developed by <clears throat> Argo National Lab. The image on the right is a snapshot of their web page. <clears throat> and it's very it's fairly straightforward to build and um, quite small in size. Uh, <clears throat> just as computation and communication can be profiled, so can file I.O. be profiled. And it can subsequently be <clears throat> optimized. Um, in HPC applications, you can have POSIX I.O., <clears throat> MPR I.O., Parallel Net CDF, and Parallel HDA5. And Darshan is able to profile all four methods, and it can only profile MPI codes. So your <clears throat> code must call MPI finalize, and if you call MPI abort, <clears throat> Darshan will not create the uh, trace file. However, serial codes can also be profiled, <clears throat> but you must enclose it with the MPI in it and MPI finalized, and you simply run it <clears throat> with a single process as shown here. Hybrid <clears throat> MPI and OpenMP is also supported. 
Uh, the I.O. is usually done by the MPI process. <clears throat> if you're doing I.O. In, in an open MP region, you have to be careful how you do that. Uh, <clears throat> Darshan only profiles C, C++, and Fortran, which are the traditional compiled languages. It has been used for MPI for Python, but it's not fully supported and tested. And Darshan instruments <clears throat> I.O. It doesn't do statistical sampling, <clears throat> and that means the profiles are accurate. And the way it does it, it intercepts each I.O. call. And during your MPI application execution, each MPI process collects its individual I.O. metrics. And they're collected when MPI finalized is called. And a single MPI process then gathers all the trace data and it creates a trace file. And the memory footprint of each MPI process is around two megabytes. To invoke Darshan, you don't need to make any code changes, and dynamic executables don't even need to be recompiled. <clears throat> However, static executables need to be recompiled using Darshan MPI wrappers. Uh, <clears throat> Darshan provides a summary of I.O. statistics as well as a timeline, and I will show you uh, <clears throat> an example of that. Uh, to <clears throat> profile a dynamic <clears throat> executable, <clears throat> um, in Linux, you do the LD preload method, as shown here, followed by the execution of your code. So that's MPI run, however many number of processes, and your executable. For Python, you can only use the LD preload method because Python is a dynamic language. <clears throat> After your application executes and calls MPI finalize, a trace file can be found in the Darshan log directory, and it has this format shown here. From the trace file, um, you can create a um, PDF report using the Darshan job summary Perl script, or you can view the individual uh, statistics using the Darshan parser script. The previous command <clears throat> aggregates the data and it shows the performance of, uh, <clears throat> of all files. However, if you want the performance per file, you can use the Darshan summary per file script. And <clears throat> this can be useful if you want <clears throat> to focus on specific input or output files. And the trace files are in binary format <clears throat> and they're compressed with the Zlib compression library. I'll talk about <clears throat> the overhead of Darshan. And the top right-hand side box plot shows the Darshan overhead of 6,000 MPI process with one file per process. <clears throat> and as you can see with the various versions of Darshan, the <clears throat> overhead is quite minimal. I mean, here we're measuring in terms uh, in units of seconds. The <clears throat> uh, chart at the bottom shows the shutdown time for shared file or, <clears throat> or execution. And as you can see for the various versions of Darshan, the uh, shutdown time is pretty much constant. And again, the, if you look at the units of seconds, <clears throat> uh, units are in seconds, so it's quite minimal. This <clears throat> chart shows the shutdown time for one file per process. And as you can see here on, <clears throat> on the graph, the uh, Darshan shutdown time is uh, scaling linearly. And again, the units of uh, times are in seconds. And some HPC systems switch on Darshan profiling for all their jobs, so it's quite lightweight. So I'll now show you a, a quick uh, demonstration <clears throat> uh, of Darshan. So <clears throat> I'll be executing a simple uh, MPI executable that does some I.O. So the command here shows that I'm doing an LD preload and I'm pointing it to the Darshan shared uh, library. And then that is followed by the execution of my MPI code and that stays the same. So the only difference is that I'm doing an LD preload prior to the execution command. And I'll now execute that and that will run for 120 iterations and I should finish in a a few seconds now. <clears throat> uh, 
So as you can see here, it's created the Darshan trace file and I will now create the uh, PDF report. So that prints a few, uh, few metrics which I won't talk about in this presentation. So that's created a PDF report which I'll just copy over to my desktop. I'll try and so <clears throat> I'll focus on the uh, top left hand um, uh, <clears throat> bar chart when PDF uh, gets processed. So the top left-hand bar chart shows the uh, I.O. as a percentage of runtime. So for POSIX I.O. it's very minimal, whereas for MPR I.O. you can see it's uh, just over 60%. And from this bar chart you can see whether I.O. is a performance issue or not. So for the red portion of the uh, chart you can see this is read and it's doing uh, a lot of write, which is the green. And the uh, bar chart on the top right hand corner is the iteration count. So you can see for read and write, um, uh, the POSIX IO is in red and MPI collective is blue and green is uh, MPI independent calls. So you can see there's quite a large number of uh, IO operations. However, the good thing about this is that it's doing IO collective operations. MPI collective operations are much better than independent write operations. It's 20 uh, open operations as well as a, over 20 seek operations. So what that means, it's doing a lot of seek, it's moving around the file. So that, that could be potentially a performance issue. So I'll move down to the bottom bar charts, <clears throat> the access sizes which is between four megabytes and 10 megabytes, which is reasonably good. And for MPRIO, this is um, between one megabyte and four megabyte, which is quite good. And at the very top, it shows the, the bandwidth. Uh, so it's writing 240 megabytes at 16, 17, megabytes per second. So what you can do, you can increase the number of MPI ranks and seeing if your bandwidth is increasing. And then from that, you can determine if you if you have a performance issue. <clears throat> and it also presents some tables at the bottom on access sizes for POSIX and MPI. Here you can see the access sizes are over one megabyte, which is quite good. <clears throat> and the number of to total number of open files are two read-only files, write-only files. So it's working with a small number of files, which is good. If you're operating on a large number of files, that can potentially be a performance issue. And this shows the I.O. timeline. Here you can see that it's doing a lot of write operations and a small bit of read operation. And it shows you where in the timeline this is occurring. I'll skip this graph and this <clears throat> table at the bottom here it shows which file systems are being used and this is potentially quite useful if your application is using a slow NFS mount rather than a high performance file server uh, file system <clears throat> you can see that and this is showing the POSIX IO pattern uh, sequential and consecutive means whether it's doing uh, I.O. consecutively or sequential, meaning it has to do a seek operation. So <clears throat> ideally you want to do as many consecutive operations as possible. And <clears throat> the table at the bottom shows the, <clears throat> the variance in shared file I.O. So this is showing that rank <clears throat> eight sent zero bytes, whereas rank zero sent 240 megabytes. So th this application is load balancing quite poorly. And that's something that you can address in your code. 
I'll now <clears throat> move back to the uh, presentation, <clears throat> I'll not, uh, which I'll now talk about some uh, real case studies where Darshan <clears throat> was used. Uh, and GBmol DD is a computational chemistry code. This was actually reviewed <clears throat> uh, and analyzed under a POP uh, audit. Uh, <clears throat> this simulates coarse grain uh, systems. <clears throat> And this uses the uh, POSIX IO file model using n colon n. So each MPI rank is writing to its unique portion, sorry, to its own file. So the line graph on the left shows the scalability. So the blue line here shows the 80% um, of linear scalability. And 80% is what we consider to be the cutoff for good performance. And the red line shows the actual application bandwidth. So you can see the red line is far away from 80% of linear bandwidth. So we knew that there's a performance issue here. So we delved a bit deeper into the Darshan IO performance statistics to see why that's the case. And we, uh, the bar chart on the right shows uh, for 64 MPI ranks, 6% of its time was spent in IO. <clears throat> Whereas 5% of that time it was spent in metadata time, which meant it was creating a lot of files and that had a lot of high metadata overhead. <clears throat> uh, so <clears throat> for 64 processes, it had to create 192 files. And remember that parallel file systems have fewer metadata servers, so this becomes a bottleneck. And with this code, the separate files had to be post-processed into a single file. So that takes more time. So the recommendation was to use a parallel file format, such as MPIO, NetCDF, or HDF5, either using N colon 1 or the N colon M model. <clears throat> the next case study is a <clears throat> combustion code, which was checkpointing, um, creating 20 gigabyte files. <clears throat> and the uh, file creation time was considerable. Uh, so each checkpoint time took 728 seconds, and that was reduced to 25 seconds when the files were pre-created. So the code was profiled with Darshan. After they optimized the I.O., they also added another optimization where they aggregated the right operations with block alignment, and that, that increased the right aggregates from four megabytes to 16 megabytes and reduce the number of write operations from 16,000 to 4,000. So the bar chart on the right shows the bandwidth per compute node. <clears throat> and as you can see, <clears throat> uh, the performance, the bandwidth increased with the uh, MPIO version. The next <clears throat> case study is uh, PDE Sova that uses adaptive meshes. Each MPI process <clears throat> wrote to its own box, so which meant that um, it created a lot of independent write operations. So this was optimized <clears throat> with aggregate collective buffering. <clears throat> so where they aggregate the write operations and the performance is shown on the right hand side, where the lower the bar chart, the better performance. So you can see with independent IO, <clears throat> the performance is qu uh, quite poor. With collective buffering, <clears throat> using MPIO and uh, aggregate collective buffering. So the performance was increasing. <clears throat> with Darshan, they measured the number of write operations with aggregate collective buffering. This was just under 7,000 compared to 120,000. And access sizes doubled from four megabytes. <clears throat> and with aggregate collective buffering, the write sizes increased all the way to 100 megabytes to one gigabytes. And again, all these statistics were uh, obtained from Darshan. So I'll now com <clears throat> complete with programming hints and tips. <clears throat> so what can we learn from all this, uh, <clears throat> uh, this presentation? But, uh, remember that parallel file systems are bandwidth bound. So try and write and read large amounts of data with fewer operations. And <clears throat> try and reduce the number of files that are created. Remember, file creation is expensive particularly for very large number of MPI processes. Try and avoid POSIX IO as much as possible for data. Um, it's acceptable for configuration files because you're not really reading that much data, but it's not very good for very large data files. And try and write data contiguously to avoid expensive file seek operations. And try and avoid 
opening and closing files multiple times. So open it once <clears throat> when you do uh, MPI in it, read and write the data <clears throat> and uh, close it at the very end. Um, <clears throat> with data, uh, either use MPIO, Parallelnet CDF, or Parallel HDF5. And also try and use ag uh, IO aggregation for small writes. So you might have a bit of data you want to write. What you could do, you can write that into <clears throat> buffer memory. For example, you can put that in a in an array, <clears throat> and then fill that array with as much data as possible, and then do the write in one operation. The configuration file should be read by a single MPI process and then broadcast it to all other MPI processes. <clears throat> it's actually much better to do it that way rather than all MPI processes reading that same configuration file. <clears throat> uh, MPIIO also offers <clears throat> uh, MPIIO hints, so you can use MPI info set and you can provide it various hints <clears throat> and you can look into the MPI standard to learn more about that and also liaise with your mm, storage system administrators on what are the optimal hints for the file system that you have. If a shared file model is not suitable for, <clears throat> for your parallel file system because of, uh, for example, a lot of lock contention, then try and use the N colon M approach. And <clears throat> with MPIO, try and use as uh, many col MPI collective I/O subroutines instead of MPI uh, independent calls. The reason why is that when you <clears throat> execute uh, a <clears throat> collective subroutine, the the runtime library knows how to optimally do the individual writes. So, what's the best approach to use? <clears throat> n colon m, m colon one, n colon one, or even n colon n. This is really a trade-off between a file lock contention and metadata creation time. So the suggestion is <clears throat> uh, to use n colon one for small uh, level parallelism, m colon for one for medium level parallelism, and n colon m <clears throat> for very large n. You can use the generic n colon m and adjust the m according to number of MPI processes and your parallel file system. For very large MPI process counts, you can create two communicators. One communicator will have N minus M processes to do the computation and M processes to do the um, IO asynchronously. For M colon one and N colon M approaches, select M such that it is the square root of N. And that will assume you have the right balance between the number of I.O. nodes and the compute nodes. And the system administrators will should know <clears throat> what the right balance is. And the <clears throat> other suggestion is, of course, profile your code. You'll be uh, surprised to learn about the performance characteristics by profiling <clears throat> your code. You, otherwise, you just will not know how your code is performing. <clears throat> and if it's performing well, why? And if it's performing bad, why is it performing bad? And subsequently, what you can do about it to increase the performance. And you might have heard about the recent CPU bugs, such as uh, Meltdown. And there's a, a lot of talk about how it's going to affect performance. Um, <clears throat> there is There are two references which um, talk about how these CPU bugs are affecting I.O. performance. Uh, so it's quite important that you profile your code to get better, uh, as much performance as possible. I'd like to thank a couple of colleagues who've helped me uh, produce this presentation, and they're listed here. <clears throat> and um, I'll go through a few questions. Um, so the first question is, do I have an affiliation with Darshan? Um, I don't have any, uh, I don't know what you exactly mean by affiliation, but I don't work for Argonne National Lab. I work for Numerical Algorithms Group, and I don't contribute to the Darshan um, profiling tool. So the next question is, could you please talk about the performance of different I.O. libraries, such as HDF5? CGNS and MPIO. For people who are not aware of CGNS, this is a uh, HDF5 abstraction 
so it sits on top of HTML5. So <clears throat> MPI <clears throat> IO is <clears throat> a very low level library <clears throat> and HDF5 sits on top of H MPIO and uses MPIO. So you're unlikely to get better performance <clears throat> than MPIO by using HDF5. However, uh, <clears throat> and I've also looked at the performance differences between MPIO and HDF5. HDF5 is slightly slower. However, I wouldn't <clears throat> necessarily recommend using uh, MPIO because it's quite low level uh, and I actually think HDF5 is quite a good library. It provides portability, it provides very convenient <clears throat> uh, features that are very helpful for people's development uh, workflow. So <clears throat> the question is does the features uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> give enough value to warrant the performance overhead? My personal opinion is yes. Uh, I think HDF5 is a brilliant library and it should be used if it's useful for your workflow. So what the question is, what are pre-created files? So when your application is <clears throat> creating files, it like, tells the operating system to create the files for you and that takes a bit, quite a bit of time. The what the developers, I did, I presume, is that they pre-created it, meaning that they created the files using the Linux touch command. So those files already existed. So the operating system did not have to create that file. So the next question is, when you say seek, do you mean seek syscall or changing right offset <clears throat> into the file? Um, I'm not 100% sure about that. I think I know what the answer is. If I could, I will get back to the person who asked that question to me after I've uh, did a <clears throat> bit of uh, research. So the next question is, can Darshan provide more info than, for instance, more general purpose profiling tools such as Skalaska, Tau, HPC, Toolkit? Um, <clears throat> I don't know exactly what you mean by more info, um, because Skalaska and Tau, H, um, I'm not sure about HPC Toolkit, they do, I think they might cover I.O., but they don't give you the detail I.O. metrics that Darshan does. Darshan is more specific for I.O., whereas Skalaska and Tau are more for computation and communication. So I do think it gives more I.O. information than the other tools where it gives you the information that you need. I'm not sure, but I can certainly take that conversation offline with the person who asked that question. Next question. Do you have, uh, next question is, do you have an example of Darshan summary per file uh, <clears throat> SH script? I do not have an example, um, but it's very easy to use. From the trace file that you create, <clears throat> you just execute the same, uh, the different script and you give it an output directory. So that's the only difference is that you create, an, you give it an output directory. You can very easily try that yourself. <clears throat> However, if you need more information, um, do contact one of the presenters who will pass um, your question over to me. So the next question is, you commented on aggregating with a specific block size. How can uh, one determine that size? I think you'll have to <clears throat> um, speak to the um, HP system administrators or the vendor that develops that parallel file system because they will have <clears throat> different block sizes for different file systems. So I think you're probably better off contacting the vendor to get the optimal uh, block size that might have changed in your installation. So you, in which case you can contact the system admins. The next question is, what are the basic steps to develop a similar tool? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I have not developed uh, a profiling tool myself, um, but <clears throat> you can certainly contact the uh, Darshan developers who developed the tool. <clears throat> They're quite open. 
Next question is, if you use C and C++ I/O routines in MPR, is there any difference when using MPR I/O? I presume you're, you mean using POSIX I/O <clears throat> compared to MPR I/O. Um, POSIX I/O is a very old API. When POSIX I/O was designed, it wasn't designed with parallelism in mind. <clears throat> We're using it mainly for legacy reasons and uh, <clears throat> compatibility. Um, whereas MPR IO is a, a proper parallel <clears throat> um, library, so this will give you proper parallel um, <clears throat> uh, features and performance. As I mentioned, if you create <clears throat> um, <clears throat> individual files for each MPI process, you will have a lot of metadata overhead, and that can reduce the performance. And that brings us to the end of our presentation, and I'd like to thank everyone uh, for their time. As I mentioned, the slides and the presentation will be made available for everyone who's registered. Thank you.